Hello, Grade 12s. Welcome back from the short break. And just before the break, I did say that we will now refer back to our graph, which is 7.1, uh, to establish the few uh, points that we discussed earlier on. So let's start off with the demand curve. So we were told um, that our demand curve will move um, downwards, okay? Uh, from left to right, okay, because we were told from this point that the market price will be determined on the upper part of the average revenue curve, okay. So we've got our price over here, and then we've got our quantity over here, and then there's our marginal revenue over there, okay. And then what we need to know that in when looking at um, the demand um, curve of a monopolist market uh, is that the trend, the demand curve will move downwards and it will move from left uh, to right, okay? And then we know that our market price will be determined uh, based on the point where our average revenue is, so price equals to average revenue, uh, because in order for us to establish what our market price is, uh, we need to look at the upper part of the average revenue. So we've got our price here, and then we've got our quantity, and then here's our marginal revenue over here, and then we know that there will be a downward, a downward slope in terms of the demand curve, uh, that indicates uh, the monopolist uh, market. Uh, it's important that we also established the whole issue of, compet uh, of perfect competition and imperfect competition uh, because those conditions have different outcomes. So if you take a, a market and you place it under uh, uh, perfect competition, it will have a, a, a different output as compared to a market that has been placed um, under the imperfect competition. So um, do be aware of that uh, when you are plotting your graph, okay? Then our next graph that we're going to look at is the economic profit um, that is made by a monopoly. So we're focusing on the economic profit. So the couple of points that we need to note uh, before we go back to our graph. So the cost structure of the monopoly is the same as of a competitive uh, business, okay? So they will still have a cost structure as if they were comp uh, competing with other businesses. So they're not going to just be naive by the fact that they are the sole provider of the product, but of the product or service, but they will still follow the principles that will be followed by any business um, in terms of, you know, cost structure. So they still need to have financial statements, determine certain costs and how those costs will be recovered. Um, so it will be the same as the one that you will find in a competitive business. Determine the point where MC equals to MR, the point where the production cost of the last unit is equal to the revenue it earns, which is point E. And then also then uh, profit uh, maximizing uh, production quantity of Q1 on the horizontal axis. So let's go back to our curve and let's just see a few of these things that we've just um, mentioned. So we know that the cost structure will be the same as the one that you find in a competitive business. Okay, so here's our point E over there, our equilibrium point. And um, so we will come back to that. And then we have our price over here. And then we have our quantity over here. So here's Q1 there. And then we have price there. Here's our, um, much, uh, our average costs. Uh, are there, then we've got um, average revenue, we, which equals to um, our demand curve, and then we have our marginal costs over there. So a couple of things that we, we've identified in, 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 in our graph, but we know that our equilibrium point uh, will be over there. Okay, so to determine the price at which uh, Q1 is sold, uh, is sold uh, move vertically upwards uh, from E to L, okay? Now, if you want to establish the price, the, uh, the quantity, which is Q1, you want to establish the price uh, for this quantity, then we need to move from E to L in order to establish uh, this price. Okay, so here's our equilibrium point over there. 
Okay, I'm going to pull my screen down. There we are. So if we want to establish the price for Q1, so we need to move up to, to L, you know, and that would be our price over there. And that will be the price for Q1. That's the quantity um, that is supplied at this particular point. Um, so that would be at L and that would be our price. Okay, so that is moving up uh, to L in order to establish um, the price for Q1. Okay, let us continue. Um, so the market price is therefore determined at P. So the market price will be at P. So that would be uh, the, the, the point where we should be selling um, our product or service. So that would be our market price there at P. Okay. So total revenue is greater than the short term total cost. The monopolist makes a profit due to demand and cost of production. So we know why the, the monopolist is making a profit there, uh, because we know that um, there is demand for the product and also the cost of production uh, plays an important role because we did mention earlier on uh, when we were talking about the cost structure, uh, we said that the cost structure is still kept as if uh, we were running a competitive um, business, okay? So that's the cost structure over there. And then we know that uh, for our uh, market price, okay? So if we want to determine the price uh, for Q1, we have to move from point E uh, to L uh, to determine the price for Q1. And we know that at this point, uh, P will be our market price uh, that uh, we, we, we're going to be using in order to sell our products. Remember, at this point, when we talk about the market price, it means that we are maximizing um, our profits and, and we're not selling above the, the market price because if we do that, um, then we're going to lose our customers because they will consider um, going to other suppliers because of the high prices um, that we are charging. And then if we go below the market price, then we are losing um, uh, the opportunity of maximizing the profits because we have to try to maximize the profits at all times um, so that we're in a position uh, where we are making money and are able to grow our business and also contribute towards the GDP. All right, so let's sum up our lesson. So in this lesson, uh, we covered the following concepts. So we've looked at what a natural monopoly is. So we said it is characterized by high development um, costs. So if you are an entrepreneur, you are wanting to go into this market space, you must be aware that there are high development costs that are involved in terms of startup, you know, just running the business and maintaining the business. So there'll be huge amounts of money um, that will be um, involved. And then these, uh, or these costs end up uh, acting as a barrier that prevents other businesses uh, from entering the market because um, other businesses don't have the financial resources um, that are required over here in order to enter this natural uh, monopoly. So the, the fact that there are high development costs, that on its own acts as a barrier in this market and it does stop other businesses from entering um, this market space. So let's just go over this definition once more so we know that it's characterized by high development costs uh, which prevent others from entering the market. So there are barriers already in terms of entry and exit and therefore the government supplies the product, okay? And hence we have an example here, which is ESCOM, which is a government enterprise. They supply electricity in South Africa and it costs billions of rands to build and maintain power stations and therefore there are no other suppliers uh, that are providing this um, service, you know. So it's a natural thing and it's got some economic reasoning behind it you know they're not just 
putting barriers for the fun of it. Um, there are some economic objectives that could be um, achieved in doing this. Um, so there has been some economic thought um, that has gone into this. So they, they, they're not intentionally trying to block out um, other competitors uh, from entering this market space. So that's, that's the first point that we need to consider uh, when we are looking at natural uh, monopolies. And then now moving on to the artificial uh, monopolies. So here are the barriers to entry. So we have barriers because it's a monopoly. We know that it's a sole provider of a unique product and there are no closed substitutes that are available. And therefore you've got one firm or, um, or business that is providing um, that uh, product or service. So here the barriers to entry are not economic. Okay. So these ones are economic because they involve certain costs um, in terms of the high development that happens um, under the, uh, the natural monopolies. Okay. So here the, the barriers are not economic in nature. An example of a barrier is a patent. And then I've also given you a definition of what a patent is. So it is a legal and exclusive right to manufacture a product. So you as a company are given exclusive rights to manufacture a particular product. And thus it makes it difficult for other suppliers to, to, to make that product because you are the one who holds the exclusive rights of producing um, that product. So that act on its own serves as a barrier in the market. It limits or it stops other entrants uh, from entering the market because they know that they can't just go into this market space and start making this uh, product. They need to, to come and negotiate with you and you are in a position of power. So you can easily say, hang on, no, because if we give you some of the rights uh, to, to manufacture this, you know, that could compromise um, our revenue or our sales. Um, so negotiations need to happen um, in terms of, you know, discussing and perhaps, you know, outsourcing some of the work um, into other smaller businesses in order to give them an opportunity to help in manufacturing um, uh, this product. Um, we know that Janel Land Systems and, and Manufacturing, um, they have the exclusive rights uh, when it comes to this industry uh, because they, they, they can't not, they can't have other or other businesses will not be allowed uh, to manufacture uh, what they are manufacturing because they have uh, patent rights uh, in terms of the products that they are um, supplying or offering okay so in terms of also intellectual property we spoke about um, that earlier on so that they could be intellectual property rights um, that are imposed on a, a, a product or a service which stops um, other suppliers uh, from uh, offering that particular product because then they have to come into negotiations uh, with the company that has the legal rights of manufacturing that product. So it's very, very important uh, for us to have a good understanding of these natural and artificial monopolies and also try to understand the whole concept of what imperfect competition is all about uh, as compared to perfect competition. So let's also just recap on that because uh, we still have a bit of time to do that. So we know with, with, with perfect competition, uh, there are no barriers in terms of entry and exit. Um, information is made available and accessible. Um, so no one gets exclusive um, information beforehand in order to gain that competitive advantage. Um, and, and also um, businesses are allowed to come in and out um, and also the price in the market is, demand, is, is, is determined, in other words, by the market forces, and that is supply and demand. Whereas with imperfect competition, um, information is not made available uh, and accessible to all the uh, suppliers or businesses in that market. You know, there are some businesses or firms or individuals that will have exclusive um, access to information 
and, and then they would benefit from that, the fact that they've received uh, information before others, and then they will use that to gain that competitive advantage, and, and hence placing the other um, firms or businesses at a disadvantage uh, because they did not have access uh, to the information whilst the others had it uh, before them. So those are some of the forces um, that we interact with when we interact with when looking at the dynamics of imperfect markets. Well, that's a wrap of today's lesson from me, Ospiwe. Cheers. <laughs>